If you've spent a lot of time reading internet creepypastas, especially gaming-related stories, there's one in particular that you might know for being a real ROM hack that appeared one day on a forum for modifying Super Mario World. It was filled with empty levels and threatening messages, but is most well known for being associated with a frightening image. A distorted photo of a red-lit face in deep shadow, contorted into an expression of agony. But we'll get to that later. The point is, that image has risen to become one of the most famous creepypasta images of all time, and to this day, there's still loads of debate about where the image first came from, and what it actually shows. For this video, however, I want to take a step back and talk more about the circumstances surrounding the photo's rise to fame, the hack itself, and the mysterious person who created it. Those details are often overlooked, and videos I see on the subject usually get a handful of important details wrong. In this video, I would like to set the record straight and explain the full story of the Mario creepypasta, and the mini-ARG that followed. It all began on SMW Central, a community gaming website dedicated to modding, or ROM hacking, Super Mario World. The site has a section for archiving the various ROM hacks that people have made over the years, and anyone can submit their own hack as long as they have an account. When a hack is submitted, it goes to the public waiting to be moderated section, where it sits until a staff member chooses to either accept it into the main section, or reject it, either for breaking the rules or otherwise being poorly made. On December 27th, 2010, a user registered an account on the site and submitted their first hack, simply titled MARIO, in all caps. The only information advertised on the submission page was a gibberish description and a single screenshot of a bland-looking title screen. It probably wouldn't have been noticed by too many people if not for what happened the following day. The forum user Adam made a thread and explained that he had found and played the hack the previous night, while he and his friends were going through recent submissions to make fun of the ones that looked poorly done. When he noticed the hack simply titled Mario, he downloaded the hack out of curiosity, thinking it would be especially bad. But what he found proved to be more disturbing than funny. I want to make a quick note here and point out that Adam's story is fairly long, and makes a lot of specific references to things that might only make sense to people who already know a lot about Super Mario World. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to summarize the story in layman's terms, so anyone should be able to understand it. The hack's download contained two files, the hack itself, and a strange text document. When Adam opened the text, he found what appeared to be an endless stretch of garbage, random letters and symbols. On closer inspection, however, the first line contained the phrase, Find me, repeated over and over again. Unsure of what to think, Adam moved on to play the game itself. Upon loading the ROM in his emulator, the first thing he noticed was that the ROM's header had been changed, which if you don't know, is basically just the little text that pops up when the game is first loaded, as a way of making sure that the emulator or console is running the right game. This is actually pretty hard to change without using advanced tools, like a hex editor, so when Adam noticed this, he got his hopes up, thinking that the hack might actually impress him. But as soon as the title screen appeared, he began noticing things that weirded him out. The color palette for Mario was made dull and less vibrant, causing him to look sad in a way that told Adam something was wrong, like something had happened. When he moved forward and saw the intro message, he noticed that a single word had been changed from the original intro, replacing Bowser 
with Mario as the villain of the game. As Adam continued, he found that the game's overworld had been left intact, and that almost every level was nearly identical to how it was in the original game, but with a dark twist. Most of the levels were completely devoid of enemies and coins, and the blocks that would normally contain coins when you jumped into them appeared to have already been hit. It was as though you were traversing levels that someone had already gone through. Some levels also had no music, and more dull color palettes. One level was completely transformed into a flat, barren wasteland. But the creepiest things in the hack were the messages. The names of the levels, and the message blocks that used to contain gameplay tips, had been replaced with messages that told Mario he was no longer welcome here and to turn back from doing something. These included things that said, Never come back. And, This is the selfish way out. And, But, Is there anything I can do to change your mind? And even one that simply said, I hate you. There was also a message that was filled with binary code, it translated to Notepad, as if to encourage the player to take a closer look at the Find Me text. Throughout all of this, Adam described being increasingly creeped out by the contents of the hack, not sure what to make of any of it. But he pressed onwards, morbidly fascinated by the game, and curious to see what would happen next. Personally, what I find most fascinating about the hack is the contrast between the aspects that look lazily done and the aspects that seem much more carefully planned. After all, it's not unusual for new users to submit hacks consisting of barely edited levels, but it's extremely rare for anyone, even more experienced hackers, to know how and care enough to change the ROM header. And that's not the only example of these contradictions either. It looks lazy to leave the overworld the same, but not lazy at all to change the color palettes. It seems bland to remove most of the message block text, but much more thought out to take the time to convert messages into binary. It seems lazy to barely edit most of the levels, but not lazy to completely overhaul Yoshi's Island 3. Well, less lazy, anyway. I'm no expert on psychology, but I believe that this juxtaposition of ideals is part of what made the hack seem so disturbing. A recurring theme in Adam's recollection is that every once in a while he would see something that gave him hope in the hack, that something fun and interesting awaited him up ahead, only to be disappointed the next time he would enter a level and find it flat and empty, or hit a message block and find it barely changed. By putting these occurrences side by side with things that seem more thoroughly edited, and blocks containing more original messages, the blander elements evoke a stronger set of negative feelings, both in disappointment toward the emptiness, and in teasing the player by prolonging the anticipation of what will come next. Not only does this leave the player waiting long for the other shoe to drop, but it makes them constantly wonder if it ever will drop at all. Unfortunately for Adam, however, it eventually did drop, by the time he reached the final level of World 1 the fortress level. After running through another cryptic level, featuring a long corridor of message blocks, containing the text, Don't you think you've caused enough trouble? Over and over and over again, he reached the usual boss fight. In a small detail that I've always found incredibly interesting, Adam mentions that he won the fight in just two hits and that it was the quickest he'd ever won that fight before, as if the power of fear and urgency somehow made him better at the game. But, during the victory cutscene, the message that usually appears was replaced with something that looks less like a congratulatory message, and more like a summary from an autopsy report. It read, Victim number one. Eyeballs were unable to be found. 
the victim was found lying on her carpet. Causes of death unknown. Hand marks with unidentifiable fingerprints were found all over the corpse. After this horrific message, the hack culminates in one final level, which immediately presents the player with two seemingly contradictory messages. There's no way out of here. And fly away. The level then leads the player into a sort of cave, filled with doors that can't be passed through. A series of invisible pipes leads the player deeper into the cave, before blacking out entirely as the game crashes. You cannot progress any further. Adam's story concluded with him making a thread on the forums and documenting his experiences, as I've described up to now. He ends the account with his own personal interpretation of the hack. Mario had gone to the dark side, done something terrible, and possibly killed someone. His experiences in the hack were a representation of him atoning for his actions and coming to terms with what he'd done before finally dying. He signs off by reminding the users of the site not to be too scared, as it's only a hack. It can't hurt you. Or can it? And that's the original story of the hack. But our real story has only just begun. When Adam first posted the thread, most of the initial replies were from people not really taking it too seriously, and more or less making fun of Adam for being so dramatic. But things took a turn when the founder of the site, Kieran, noticed the thread and posted his own thoughts. He suspected that the mysterious notepad document that came with the hack was actually a different type of file converted into a text, specifically a JPEG image file. When he attempted to convert it himself, he uncovered a heavily corrupted picture of what looked like a strip of red light. And after doing a Google search for similar images online, he discovered an incredibly disturbing image that seemed to match up perfectly. After Kieran shared his findings, the user Mew pointed out that the image seemed to eerily align with the hack's description of victim number one. Once all of this was pointed out, the tone of the thread completely changed. Most people went from laughing at the ridiculousness of the story to being horrified by the hack and the image that came with it, while others were impressed at the way everything seemed to tie together. People began digging into the hack's files, and found more cryptic messages within the hack, most notably including ones that said, I don't think you should be here. And, At the current hour, there is no known treatment for the disease. The best we can do is provide drugs to ease the pain. A second binary message was also discovered, simply translating to, Please find me. Adam's story was soon posted to the Creepypasta wiki along with a summary of the aftermath, where it eventually went viral in the community of creepy gaming. The story was popularized in 2013 after videos documenting the incident were made by Mudahar of Some Ordinary Gamers and Mullet Mike of The Sticky Paddle. The story quickly attracted a ton of fans, largely due to the freaky image, but also due to it being a rare example of a creepypasta that's actually a true story. The author really did discover a creepy game, write about his experiences, and cause other users to dig further into it and uncover more of the story. The hack, the image, and Adam's tale were immortalized forever. And for most people, that's where the story ends. But for users on SMW Central, and others who were curious enough to look more closely, 
there was much more that awaited them. Of course, the hack didn't come out of thin air. In order to submit a hack to SMW Central, you need an account. So it wasn't long before people started paying attention to the account that submitted the mysterious hack. An account with a name similar to the hack's title. M. A. R. I. O. Mario in all caps, but with the letters spaced out. The account's original profile image was a sprite of Mario from Super Mario World, but with the eyes erased. In his profile's public file bin, he originally hosted one file. It was called Happy, without any extension, but when opened as an image, it revealed a strange smiley face. For a time, the account was inactive, but toward the end of January 2011, the strange user began posting, announcing around the forums that he was working on what he claimed would be his first hack, something he called Super Mario Ultimatum. And on February 5th, he made a thread to release it. The first patch he posted was much shorter and emptier than his first creation. The opening message simply said, Home sweet home, in broken text. The game consisted of an empty overworld with a single level. The level was nothing more than a long, black corridor with a single empty message box. At first glance, this patch looked to be a fairly disappointing follow-up to the first hack, but when users looked through the game's files, more weird messages were found, including shallow water, more instances of the phrase home sweet home, and another disturbing message that seemed to be a continuation of the list of victims. Victim number two. Although he was still alive when he was found starving in an abandoned apartment, he died from blood loss on the way to the hospital. The place has, apparently, no tenant or owner. Curiously, most people who saw the thread downloaded a different file from the one I just described. It turns out, only a couple days after the thread was posted, MARIO silently edited the post to link to a completely different hack, leading to confusion in the thread as it took some time for people to realize that they were trying to discuss their experiences with two completely different patches. The second version proved to be more interesting. The overworld was left the same as in the original game, but the player was now able to travel much farther. If you took the path to the right of the starting point, then you could actually beat the game. On this path, the levels are all unedited, with the message boxes being the only things changed. Many of them contain texts that are either nonsensical such as half full and here lies flat out creepy and mysterious such as stained purple with blood and it's all lies you shouldn't listen or look to be isolated parts of a larger story messages that seem to fall into this category include can't she take medication she'll get better won't she? I made a cake, Mario. But it wasn't for you. It was only a prank. And... And once we had made it there, there was nothing but a smile. But the doll wouldn't stop, so we ditched her. I miss her so much. Finally, there's one message found in the hack that's not accessible in the game at all. It reads, Transmission begins at 3, 25, 2014. Reminder that this hack was released in early 2011, making a three-year time gap between the two dates. 
Aside from the transmission date, all of these messages are only discovered if you play through the game along the right-hand path. But if you choose to go left, something completely different is found. Yoshi's Island 1 is a brand new level. It's actually fairly well designed for an early stage, and the first message block makes sense, describing a pipe maze that is hidden somewhere in the level. Unsurprisingly, however, it isn't long before this all falls apart. Once you reach the level's midpoint, you're greeted with a new message, telling you, There's no way out of here. And the stage ends with a bottomless pit, which we have no choice but to jump into. However, this is where things get clever. Due to the way the midpoint entrance is set up, re-entering the level after dying allows you to finally access the so-called pipe maze a complex system of rooms which inevitably leads you to a much more distorted area, where the graphics have all been dulled and pixelated beyond recognition. After traversing through a sequence of strange paths and shapes, we come upon one final message, written out in block letters. I shaped a brave new world, and we were the only ones within. But now there is nothing. Come home. A set of pipes crashes the game shortly afterwards, just like in the first hack. Personally, I don't think this hack is as creepy as the first one, but it does feel a lot more sad. Don't get me wrong, even the right-hand path still has some creepiness to it. The player is always in anticipation of what might come next, dreading the next message they come upon. But since the levels themselves are the same, and a lot of the messages are either nonsensical or left blank, the feeling evoked is more like claustrophobia than actual fear. It's a very oppressive atmosphere. I think the site user Ramo's Nephew does a fantastic job of describing it. He believes that the hack is about Mario trying to run away from a tragedy in his life by burying himself in his usual work. As Ramo's nephew explains, But it does a little good. If we take the right-hand path, what do we get? The same old, worn-out task we've done a million times. Only this time, it seems a lot more pointless. We don't seem to be questing for any heroic goal, just out of habit and it's thoroughly lost its thrill. And all around us, where we would normally get friendly points of advice, Mario instead only sees, presumably imagined, insults, accusations, and painful reminders which fill him with regret. There is nothing to be gained on this path. He goes on to theorize that the left-hand path and the cave system is an elaborate representation of Mario disconnecting himself from the world around him disavowing his former identity and ego in an abstract way. You can think of it as a form of suicide if you'd like, though that might be an oversimplification. I won't read aloud his entire post, but it's a pretty convincing and detailed analysis. I'll link to the post in the description of the video. After this, the creator took a break from making hacks, but continued to captivate other users with a series of more mysterious files that he would post to his file bin. Most of these files have since been deleted, but through methods I'll explain later, I managed to get my hands on many of them, and will be showing them off as I can. It began with a series of photos of caves, showing holes and what looked to be parts of bodies. It was quickly realized that the images were taken from another creepypasta, the classic Ted the Caver though users suspected that the images had nonetheless been chosen to represent the cave that was trapping Mario in the hacks. As time went on, however, the files he uploaded seemed increasingly disconnected, and users began struggling to make sense of them. In April, he advertised what he claimed was music he had written, but the files he posted were usually either downloads of other songs, or were the sounds of Morse code. When translated, the first one said, Hello? Yvette? Are you there? I have to tell you about something very important. 
It has to do about Catherine. I am worried about her. Another Morse code file, apparently translated to... It's too late for her. She's gone. Blood. Some of the audio files published by the account were even deeper than this. Several of them would sound like gibberish at first, only to reveal strange imagery when viewed as a spectrogram in any audio software. One such file showed text. This is a quote from the second book of Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. Other files showed alien-looking faces. Both of these images were taken from the website Yvette's Bridal Formal, an incredibly bizarre website that could honestly warrant having its own video. Other audio files showed more creepy images, though I couldn't track down the sources for all of them by myself. Another interesting file he submitted was this video, entitled My Home. I'm not entirely sure what this is, but it was later explained to me that these symbols are a reference to some older ARG. I still haven't figured out what that ARG was, but apparently the symbols translate to the phrase, We finally found her. Other files posted to the file bin included this dark image, which upon doing an image search turned out to be some kind of Yume Nikki fan art, this image, which, I'm not sure what it is, but several users pointed out that it kind of looks like a man in a suit. This image, showing weird homunculus-like figures, and several other files I ultimately couldn't recover. Such as one photo of what users described as looking like either a man dying in a building, or a cobblestone path leading up to some sort of archway or castle. With one user, Excavator, claiming that it especially reminded him of Windsor Castle in England. Another lost file was a video that apparently showed a strange image with random background noises. After a while, the user posted another hack. On August 19th, he joined the site's IRC server and posted a new link. This one was fairly short though, and didn't contain any interesting text. All it really had was a dark cave, with foreground graphics that caused Mario to become invisible, forcing the player to run down a cramped hallway for a while before being killed. Users were even less sure what to make of this hack, and due to the lack of messages, no one really had any convoluted theories about it like before. In fact, an unfortunate trend was beginning to develop around this point that as the files became increasingly obtuse, fewer and fewer people seemed to pay attention, and files were uploaded less and less often. It seemed like the dark tale was coming to an end. I'm going to say right now that from here on out, this is where things will start being much less creepy, and everything will ultimately be explained, albeit not exactly in the most satisfying way. If you like the mystique of the affair up to now, and you don't want that to be ruined, then now might be a good time to leave the video, but I thank you for watching all the same.
Anyway, as more time passed, the files submitted by the user started seeming less creepy and more random, as they looked more and more like disjointed references to internet culture. This trend started with a series of images featuring Rainbow Dash from My Little Pony, with her eyes blacked out. People found this more funny and kind of silly than actually all that creepy. As this continued, users discussed being disappointed by the silliness of the newer files compared to the disturbing first couple of hacks, and even when MIRAO did upload something that was genuinely creepy at first glance, users would still be disappointed when it was discovered that they were just taken from something else, like with the Ted the Caver photos. In fact, even the frightening victim number one photo that launched the hack into fame turned out to be stolen as well. As the user Vic Rattlehead discovered, the image actually came from a 2009 4chan thread in which people were claiming that the image was haunting their computer and making strange files appear on their desktop. The story and mystery of that image is honestly another beast entirely, and it's very possible that I'll make a video focusing solely on that photo, as I just don't have the time to cover it all here. But the point is this, the jig seemed to be up and MARIO himself appeared to realize this too. Throughout late 2011, more and more of his posts appeared normal, as though he had given up on being creepy and was now trying to participate in the community just like anyone else. He occasionally posted images and artwork that looked fairly ordinary, as though he was using his profile as a substitute for Photobucket, and he even made a goofy, out-of-character comic joking about people's reactions to his puzzles. He wasn't completely done yet, though. On Halloween, he seemed to go for one last hurrah. He deleted every single file that was in his file bin, hence why some of them are lost now, and uploaded one new file, called hello.mp3. When this file was reversed and slowed down, the following message was found. I have a message for you. G. 1. B. X. 24. J. Z. You two had better hurry up. Following the hint and searching the code on YouTube revealed a channel with one video that had been posted that same day. The video showed black and white footage of a person in a chair, seemingly being taunted by someone else. I later discovered that this video is actually an edited version of this obscure video from the Christian Weston Chandler archive. The video's audio consists of Morse code, which translates to, Were you looking for something in particular? You will have to look in a place 20% cooler. If you don't know, the phrase 20% cooler is another reference to My Little Pony. So in the end, the new audio file was ultimately a wild goose chase that didn't amount to much other than trolling some people. After this, it seemed like he really did give up. From here on out, he put the weird internet culture references on full throttle, posting artwork and songs that reference things like Sonic, Homestuck, HouseMD, Valve, and even Disney, but without having any other creepy messages hidden within. He also posted a Gmod save file, and I have to thank the user James and Lullify for managing to open it and take screenshots to send to my Discord server. But in the end, there wasn't much of interest in that either, aside from another odd Disney reference, of course. But finally, after another couple of confused conversations from users, MARIO finally came clean, 
breaking character for good by admitting the shtick. Who said it ever meant anything? You're the ones being drawn by stupid, pointless files I've been uploading, not me. Ironically, though, he continued to bring up the pony topic a lot, usually in the context of making fun of people who were fans of the show. Eventually, the site's moderators got sick of his behavior, and in the summer of 2012, his account was disabled, with the ban reason given as, And your flaming has gotten on the last nerve of people. Good day. The game was over. Before I continue, I want to briefly provide some context about myself for a bit. I had known about the SMW hacking community for years prior to all this happening, but like a handful of others, the mysterious hack was a major factor that pulled my curious, younger self deeper into the community, eager to see if anything would happen next. As it turned out, several things did and I discovered some things that I don't think many other people realized. The winter after the M-A-R-I-O account was banned, an account called Mario the Time was created, and submitted a hack called Mario the Super. At first glance, it looked like another person's attempt at a creepypasta hack, though it didn't get much attention since no one was writing long, dramatic stories about it. It happened to catch my eye, however, when I noticed that the hack looked oddly familiar. On close inspection, it seemed like an expansion of the final hack that M-A-R-I-O had posted, with the cave that gradually caused the player to become invisible. Only now, the other pipes actually worked and took you deeper into the level, through an elaborate pipe maze similar to the one in the cave hack. There were also new messages, usually just saying, Time? The download also came with a pack of creepy images, most notably this one, the name of which was another HouseMD reference, and this one, which was taken from the website 973 at Nama. I tried doing reverse image searches on the other images, but the only one I found any results for was this one, which turned out to have been taken from some French home improvement forum. It looked possible that this was a case of someone else stealing M-A-R-I-O's ideas, but there were so many subtle similarities that I ended up contacting the website staff members about this, who can see user IP addresses, and they confirmed that this account came from the same person. Nothing more happened with this account, however. Those who've been with my channel for a long time might remember that, starting in early 2013, I used to do a series analyzing creepy stories on the internet, such as Marble Hornets and various ARGs. Not long after I started, I got it into my head that I wanted to do a video analyzing MARIO's account, and all the various files that came with it. But I soon hit a roadblock with all the files I mentioned that are now deleted. Even though I figured that they probably didn't contain anything too interesting, it still bothered me that I couldn't have them, as I used to be a huge stickler for completion. So, what my much younger and dumber self proceeded to do was to pretty much make a complete fool out of myself by making an account on SMWC and sending out tons of messages to people who had posted in the old threads, asking them if anyone had happened to have saved those old files. I didn't have much luck, so I proceeded to make it even worse by going to the site's IRC server and constantly derailing the conversations there to ask about it. Obviously, this annoyed the crap out of a lot of users there, and before long, I wasn't exactly everyone's favorite person to say the least. That said, I don't totally regret what I did, because after a few days of this, something awesome actually came of it. In April 2014, I received a private message from someone I'd never talked to before, but whose name I had frequently seen in the list of online users in the past. I won't reveal his username, as he requested to remain anonymous, but he asked me about the files I was looking for, and claimed that he was M-A-R-I-O. I was extremely skeptical of the claim, but after some investigation, I found tons of evidence in his favor. 
First off, his IRC host mask, which is basically the IRC equivalent of an IP address, perfectly matched the host mask he had used back when his original account was active. Second, he had most of the missing files that I was looking for and sent them to me. He even sent me some things that he couldn't remember if he actually got around to submitting, such as this unsettling image. And third, he had answers for all of the questions I had time to ask him, and many of his claims were verifiable. It was he who told me where the obscure YouTube video came from, something that nobody writing in the threads ever stated. And when I asked him what inspired the victim number one message, he immediately pointed me to an old Motdef video that had an extremely similar title and description. He even told me about his account on the site that he used years before the creepypasta happened. And when I asked the site staff about this account, they once again confirmed that the IP address is matched. I eventually made up my mind to believe him and started interviewing him. The first thing I asked was what inspired the whole experience. He explained that back when he was much more into creepy things, he would get sick of seeing stories that tried too hard to have ridiculous or long-winded narratives to the point of diminishing any fear factor that the story might otherwise have. He wanted to create something where the horror was more subtle, less overtly scary, and more just something that makes the player feel odd and uneasy. He also wasn't a fan of gaming creepypastas that were unrealistic, relying on the game consoles doing things that were impossible for their hardware, like how the Ben Drowned story includes references to reversed MIDI files. He explained that his counter to this was to create his own creepy game in the form of a real ROM hack, pretty much making it as believable as it can get. The first level specifically was inspired by a 4chan post that discussed a story about Luigi traveling through the empty and barren levels after Mario had already completed them. Beyond that, however, it turns out that not much real thought went into the hack's narrative. Most of the message boxes were edited somewhat absentmindedly by simply making random changes to the messages that were originally there though some of the more unique and thoroughly edited messages were inspired by personal events from his life. For the most part, everything in the hack was put together fairly randomly. He included the frightening image with the submission because he wanted to add another layer of mystery to the hack, and chose that image specifically because it was one of the images that frightened him the most, not even realizing that people might connect it to the victim number one message. His original plan was to just submit the hack and then never log on to the site again, but of course, plans changed when Adam accidentally popularized the hack with his story. The emptiness and darkness of the sequel hacks he posted were based on something he submitted to a level design contest he had entered years earlier. The rest of the files he uploaded after that were chosen more or less randomly from other things he was into at the time, and it lost direction pretty quickly. I asked him if there ever really was a story that he was trying to tell with the hack, but he made it pretty clear that that was never the case. He said that even when he started making follow-ups, he knew he never wanted there to be any conclusions, since the story making any amount of real sense would destroy the unsettling feelings of confusion and stress that he wanted to linger. And as for the 2014 transmission date, there was no plan for that other than him wanting to give himself a large head start for something that he could take some time to prepare for. Ironically, the head start was so large that he ended up forgetting about it. Eventually, he had to go and gave me his contact information in case I wanted anything else. I ended up not really taking him up on that too much, since he'd already answered all of my big questions. I did send a follow-up email a little while later with a list of the names of the other files I was missing, but I never heard back from him after that, so I just left him alone. Coincidentally though, while I was working on this video, I started seeing him comment on other videos and answering questions about the hack under a burner account. And I'm pretty sure it's him, because the information he's giving out agrees with everything that he privately told me almost a decade ago. I took viewer questions on my channel, and in my Discord server, and tried to reach out to him once again, and he was kind enough to respond. He made it clear that there weren't any major leads that people missed out on, and any accounts other than the ones I've mentioned are unrelated to his work. He also reaffirmed that people shouldn't read too much into the messages he wrote, 
as they were entirely the result of him making things up as he went along as a bored teenager. Most of the other questions I received were ones I already answered earlier, thanks to our old IRC chat. I eventually thanked him for his time and told him I appreciated what he had done, and left it at that. And so, there you have it. I recognize that it might disappoint many of you to learn that there was never actually any grand story behind the hack or its files, but I'm hoping that we're all at least happy that there were never any real victims. In the end, all of this was just someone trying to have a laugh on the internet by creeping some people out with a weird and obtuse fan game. He never expected his work to become popular, but once the story exploded, he took advantage of his newfound fame for a while with more files and more hacks, before ultimately losing interest and moving on. I see where the guy is coming from, really. And I will say, I did learn a valuable lesson from this when the guy first reached out to me back in 2014. I spent hours poring over the files he submitted, desperately trying to make sense of it all, convinced that the creator was some kind of mastermind aiming to tell the world something through the files he posted. But when I ultimately learned the truth, it immediately seemed so obvious in hindsight. Looking back, you were definitely pretty silly for thinking that there was actually anything malicious behind the hack's origins, but in my defense, I stand by my belief that MARAO did a fantastic job of taking advantage of what TV Tropes calls the nothing is scarier trope. This trope describes how, if we're given the breadcrumbs to think that some terrifying thing will reveal itself, the mental images that our brains conjure up are always going to be far more horrifying than whatever the truth actually is. If anything, finally witnessing some conclusion will satisfy our brains with an answer, even if the answer is something disturbing. But if the other shoe never drops, then we're left hanging with anxiety forever. Nowadays, whenever I see modern ARGs present people with what looks like a slew of dark messages that people are struggling to decode, I just remember Mario and his games, and realize that there's probably not much that truly needs to be figured out. And it was also a fairly influential set of hacks, too, in the realm of Super Mario World hacking specifically. The popularity of the original hack inspired the likes of even more successful creepy hacks that showed up later, such as the I Hate You Creepypasta, and the hack simply titled The. I'll be honest, it still bothers me a little bit that there are still some deleted files that I was never able to get my hands on, but since almost everything else was just taken from other sites, memes, and ARGs anyway, I'll just optimistically assume that we aren't missing out on anything really special, or that this can all be solved one day with time travel. I'll close my synopsis on one final note. Please, please do not try to track down any of the people I've mentioned in this video, and especially not Adam. He's talked before about how many people have bothered him with messages over the years asking about this, either to accuse him of secretly being the true creator of the hack itself, or to otherwise ask him 50 questions about the story when there's simply not much for him to say. This was just a creepy hack that he happened to find, play, and write about. That's it. So please, leave him alone. So that's the full story of the Mario Creepypasta. I hope some of you found this video interesting. This is a story that's always meant a lot to me for personal reasons, and I've always wanted to do something with it to help get more of the story out there, since most people only know it for the original hack. I want to throw out a huge shout out to two people. First, the YouTuber Hey Peter, since his recent video on the subject was a big part of what inspired me to finally make this video and try my hand at making video documentaries for the first time. Part of the credit for that also goes to the YouTuber Midnight Crick, who's currently spearheading a search effort to find the true origin of that victim number one image. Both of those guys are super underrated and make some seriously awesome videos. So check them out if you've got the time. I had a lot more fun making this video than I expected to, and I'm already interested in making more video documentaries about other creepy things. If you've got any feedback on this video, or you're interested in throwing out an idea for a future one, all are welcome to share some thoughts in the comments, or in my Discord server, linked in the description below. But that's all for now, and I hope you all have a lovely day.